Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, session on Dataverse and the Core Trust Seal uh, certification. Um, very pleased uh, to be here. Um, so uh, the session is the four of us. We have Kaylin Boyd of uh, Harvard Library, um, uh, Philip uh, Consett of the <clears throat> Uh, UIT, the Arctic University, and that's Dataverse Norway, Dataverse No. I don't know how, how you usually refer to it. Um, we have uh, Sonia Barbosa of IQSS and Harvard and, uh, and Sebastian uh, Karcher of the Qualitative Data Repository, QDR. Um, here's what we have uh, in uh, stock. We have some uh, Zoom polls um, to kind of get a sense uh, where people are. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking a very tiny bit about what uh, uh, Quartrust Seal or CTS uh, is. Uh, Julian is going to be talking about some work that uh, John Crafty and him have been doing on mapping Dataverse capabilities to Quartrust Seal requirements. Um, then we'll have a short panel um, where we talk about uh, the process of uh, three uh, Dataverse installations, Harvard Dataverse NO and QDR, uh, in getting CDS, CTS uh, certified. Um, those are kind of three different installations, so we'll have uh, different perspectives on this. Uh, and then we'll have some breakout rooms. Uh, we'll come back from the breakout rooms and uh, wrap the session. And uh, that's our introductions. And uh, who's running the polls? I think I can run the polls, right? Nope. Where are the polls? Down at the very bottom of the screen, uh, Sebastian, yes, you should see it says polling. I think you can just go ahead and launch. Polls. OK. Yes, it says polling right there. And then launch polling. Yeah. OK. So go ahead and take a minute or so to answer that these. Looks like it's working. Yes, it is yep. working. They're very quick polls. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, I need to end the polls for every question. Is that right? Yes, I think so. Uh, okay. I'm going to give this. Uh, until 55 seconds, so you have 10 more seconds to log your answer. It's only been the, the first poll. There has been no second poll. All right. And then if, when I click on end polling, it moves to the next question. Yep. Yeah, I think so. Perfect. OK, the next okay, one great. is up. Uh, can people see the results? Well, actually, just the results. Yeah, so it looks like I think, you, yeah, you share the results. So 13% reply that they are core trust seal certified and 87% reply no. Okay, next up. So we have a number of people certified, most people not, and that's what we kind of expected. Um, that we already got. How do I get to the next question? Um, there. Where are you in the application process? So this is question number two, everyone. It's for Dataverse, Sherry, um, for your Dataverse installation. I mean, you can talk about any other institutional repository um, that you'd like to in here, but it is for Dataverse. All right, it looks like Thanks, the Adam. poll numbers are stopping to come in. I'm yeah, it looks pretty good. I'm okay. gonna end polling and share the results. Um, yeah, so we have a nice distribution, about half of the people 
uh, here are planning to apply. We have a number of people who are, are somewhere in the application and then uh, five people uh, who are uh, more or less uh, done. And that's it, what we, uh, that's it for polling, yep, right? Yep, that's it for polls, right. And then, all right, so um, what is the core of, uh, uh, what is the core of trust seal? Um, so the core trust seal under this name is fairly uh, new. Um, it launched in uh, 2017. Uh, but it merged two previous quite similar certifications, the data seal of approval, which was oriented more towards social science of repositories and the world data system certification. Um, while, as you'll notice, if you go through the application, it can be uh, uh, quite an effort. It is, in fact, the lowest level of data repository certification. It's... Uh, uh, requirements are based on the ISO standard, ISO 16363, um, but you can actually uh, get ISO certified. That's an uh, involved and expensive survey because that uh, it involves um, uh, on location auditors coming, uh, taking a look. So uh, I don't know, there are currently not very many repositories in the world that are ISO certified. I think there are like two or something like that. Um, uh, the core trust seal uh, contains 16 requirements in three sections. Uh, so you have organizational infrastructure. Um, how are you set up? Those sorts of things. You have digital object management, which is, as you can see, kind of the core of the application. How do you actually handle uh, the data that you're getting? And then the two uh, final requirements are uh, on technology the way the application works, and those of you who have started looking at this uh, are going to be uh, aware of this. It's a self-assessment, and that then gets reviewed by two, two peer reviewers. Those peer reviewers are made up of the core trust seal board of reviewers, which essentially is people who have gotten certified themselves and uh, are, then get uh, asked to review other applications. And so I've uh, reviewed a couple of ap applications and we had hoped that John Crafty could join us. Uh, he is actually on the board of the Core Trust Seal, uh, but he is also uh, the leading voice of the Global Dataverse Community Consortium. So he is simultaneously talking about uh, this right now. And so you'll have to do with me. Um, and we wanted to give you kind of a set of common things that, um, uh, we think people should know, people may um, get wrong uh, about court uh, trust seal applications. And the core one that's the experience of all of us that are applying is uh, court trust seal is really not about uh, technology. The focus is on documentation and on workflows, on structures. So if you want, it's a socio-technical with socio-writ large um, certification, much more than a technical certification. Uh, reviewers will take a look at your uh, description of your technology. They may browse around in your um, uh, repository, but they won't do an in-depth uh, assessment of your technology uh, stack. The second one is actually the core thing that I take away from both being reviewed and reviewing other applications. Um, your application should essentially just consist of you paraphrasing existing policies and, uh, and saying how they apply to the requirements. If there is a lot of stuff that you are explaining in the core trust seal application that isn't contained in your policies, it probably should be contained somewhere in your policies and documentation. Um, related to that, your application should contain lots of links. Probably the single most common thing that uh, I ask uh, uh, repositories, and I've seen other reviewers asking repositories to uh, fix, is including more links to specific statements or claims that uh, they're making, right? Like, we have an agreement with X. Is there a documentation uh, of that agreement? We have a policy about X. Uh, make that policy public which also means that the main work uh, applying for core trust seal isn't actually the application itself. Um, the main work is uh, uh, getting all your policies, not just written, but also written and uh, publicly 
facing to the extent possible. You can submit documents to CTS, but it's really preferred that all your documentation or almost all your documentation is publicly viewable um, rather than uh, included as an attachment with the Core Trust Seal uh, application. And that is it from uh, kind of my very brief uh, overview to Core Trust Seal. And I'm going to stop screen sharing and pass it on to Julia. Thank you, Sebastian. <clears throat> um, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Perfect. OK. I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, I can't see what you all see. Do you see? Um, do you see? Um, there we go. Do you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Yep, we can see. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Julian. Uh, I work at uh, Harvard at uh, on the Dataverse team at IQSS, and I'll be talking about um, the Dataverse guide for. CTS certification, which is in draft form right now. Um, so I'll be covering the purpose of the guide, uh, its, stru its structure, um, a couple of examples. I won't go over every, every part of the guide. Um, some of the challenges and uh, some questions toward the end, but um, I'll try to leave some of some time. Um, I'll try to leave some time for questions at the end. But I think a lot of the questions that that everyone will have um, and that I have can be discussed today during uh, the breakout sessions. And um, a lot of what I hope to learn um, will be discussed today during the the, the panelist talks um, following this one. So the purpose of the guide is to help. Um, existing and potential Dataverse-based repositories answer how does their Dataverse project help and what doesn't it do? So last fall, um, around September, I was asked to help start a document describing the ways that the Dataverse project helps. And by Dataverse project, I mean the uh, not just the software, but the informal community. Um, so the, you know, all the expertise that, that, that helps um, answer questions and, and, and provides guidance and, and all the different channels that we have. Um, and the more formal community services being organized uh, by GDCC, which would be another topic of discussion, um, as well as the software's core functionality and design principles. Um, so the guide was written to kind of try to help speed up the process by providing standardized answers um, things that each organization using Dataverse can say about how Dataverse helps and what the organi organizations will need to do in addition to that. Um, the, the structure of the guide uh, follows the structure of the certification application. So there's a section for each of the 16 sections. Um, and then I guess there's, there's also like a first section called context or background information. Um, and the guide is in a Google Doc right now, and it addresses each of those sections. So one of the examples, the, the very first section is uh, about the organization's mission and scope. Um, and that's meant to provide um, so in that one, you provide docs about the organization's mission and the level of approval. And um, I wrote about what Dataverse project does, which is basically uh, customizable home pages, headers, footers, terms of use agreements that make it easy to publicize um, mission statements. Um, there's a picture of, uh, of Sherry's um, poster, I think, uh, an, an image you had in a, in a poster last year um, for a guide that she prepared for customizing your home page. And that is a very funny uh, 
scene from an anime. So what the database project doesn't do is, of course, document um, the mission and its level of approval. It, it's not going to help you write that mission. Um, it won't have provide guidance about that necessarily. Um, uh, another example is uh, what the document says about licenses. And um, there you need to provide docs about how the repository maintains and monitors compliance of data access and use. And so Dataverse, the project, um, I mentioned the guest books and, and several access request features, um, permissions, uh, related features that help repositories maintain control over data with different access criteria. And Dataverse project does not, of course, document that as well. Um, and like Sebastian said, the big thing is showing documentation for the ways that um, your organization meets these different requirements. Um, and the last uh, example here is the continu continuity of access, uh, the third section in the application about um, providing governance related docs about how the repository ensures access to and preservation of holdings. So the CDS guidance points out that evidence for this requirement should relate more to governance than to the technical information. Um, which is what you'd provide uh, in sections later on in the application. Um, regarding this and, and many other sections in the application, there's a whole bunch of things that Dataverse project can't do. Like I said, um, who's responsible for ensuring access, who's liable, who has the expertise for making sure that published data is coupled with everything else it needs to be cited and reused and preserved. Um, so that uh, brings me to um, one of the challenges of thinking about how this guide, how we could provide this uh, kind of guidance, and I didn't want to duplicate content that already exists in the Core Trust CEO's existing guidance. Um, and there, I think, are like two, there's the application itself, and then there's another document that's geared more toward reviewers, but is also really helpful for um, applicants to look at um, trying to make clear that Dataverse project can't help with everything and that the guide doesn't include everything repositories need for certification. Um, so for, for point one, I forgot to mention also that the Dataverse, um, the user guides are also um, constantly changing and um, you know, and, and, and can be re re referenced. So I didn't, I also did not want to duplicate a lot of content about the different features of Dataverse that already exist in the guides um, when they can be referenced and, and, and uh, they're they can be up to date. Um, specifics about the features can be, um, are managed in, in a, there and then version there. Um, and lastly, um, and this is a point that I think John Crabtree um, uh, brings up often, uh, and he sees um, a lot um, with his perspective as uh, on the board, is acknowledging that many database-based repositories are not domain-specific, um, such as institutional repositories, and they won't have the resources that uh, CTS prescribes for curating every deposit. So um, what strategies for this are evolving and um, which you hear about in the panel following this talk. So um, I can take any questions uh, about anything that, you know, like I can clarify that Thank I've gone over so far. You can feel free to share a couple of questions before we move on to the next slide, if you have it. And so um, Julian, um, Oliver had asked about whether this document will be put under guys.dataverse.org or somewhere else, and I'm not sure we've decided on that. Right, yeah, yeah, we have not decided on right. that. 
And Courtney just wanted to know that um, the guide is being updated with the most recent updates in January to the application, to the CTS application and documentation, which I'm sure it is. I, um, I haven't, it's been a while since I revisited the guide actually right. um, because of other priorities, but uh, yeah, I, I saw that it was, the, the certification application was updated. I saw that it still has 16 sections, so that's good. I haven't, and I know Harvard Dataverse is working on it. There wasn't anything in particular that jumped out to me that had changed so much that I need to revise um, the draft of this guide, but yeah, we'll need to consider that. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Sure, and I think it's back to you, Sebastian. Right. Um, you are the next. You sh actually, the, yeah, we want. I think we want to talk about the qualitative data repository, and then um, Dataverse North and uh, No Dataverse No, and then uh, I'll talk about the Harvard Dataverse because you guys have done more already with the Core Trust. So sorry, that's, that's I, lost my, I lost my I lost my Google Slides. Uh, I can put it up for you if you'd like. Yes, uh, it's just three slides. So if you Maybe, want to, if you uh, want to some, just. Yeah, OK. Nope. So everybody can see my screen. And just tell me when to forward along. Yep. Yes, Sonia. Um, all right. So uh, for us, the, um, just for context, QDR, um, we are domain repositories. So uh, the. Um, core trust process is kind of designed, if you want, uh, originally with repositories like QDR in mind, which I think made this somewhat easier for us. We have also fully curated. Uh, we don't publish anything that hasn't been uh, reviewed, uh, typically touched by curators. Again, that is in line with the kind of original historical, at least, um, core trust seal and especially data seal of approval. Uh, principles. Uh, and we have a relatively small team that has uh, ups and downs. It means coordination is easier. Uh, it means fewer people can work on this. Um, uh, our certification uh, was finalized in November uh, 2018. I think uh, we actually submitted this uh, in early 2018, and, and that was when Core Trust Seal just started their new kind of submission and review system. So it took, I believe, an extraordinarily long time. Uh, typically, this shouldn't uh, take quite as long. Uh, when we started working on this, we were actually still looking at the data seal of approval as the target. Um, so that was the original criteria that we worked towards. But even with that and the revisions there were more substantive, uh, they were similar enough that we didn't really uh, waste any time by focusing on, on those older criteria. Um, next slide. Uh, so let me uh, run a little bit through how we ran the process. Um, so we uh, had one person, that would be me, who coordinated uh, the process. And I think that makes sense to have, you know, like for most tasks, you want someone uh, who gets uh, credit and blame um, and mostly who feels responsible. And then uh, what we did is we started out uh, the 16 criteria. And um, if you look at the requirements and they're posted on the Core Trust Seal site, they actually have uh, individual bullet points uh, of what a specific question should address. So uh, I forgot how many those are, but like taken together, that's something like 70 or so bullet points. And so we actually listed every one of the 16 criteria with every one of the applicable bullet points. Um, and then uh, we listed uh, which policies were already in place. And then we had a green category for that, which policies we were working on were maybe existed, but required modification uh, and uh, what we needed to write. And I'll have a screenshot of a spreadsheet of that in a minute. Um, and then uh, we assigned the missing and uh, insufficient policies uh, to teams. And uh, right, so a lot of uh, them require different sets of expertise, uh, right? So the description of our infrastructure, uh, our technical director wrote together with our DevOps um, uh, developer, 
and uh, how we handle uh, sensitive data required uh, collaboration between the curators and the uh, <clears throat> developers to describe both the uh, human process of assessing sensitive data and uh, handling it and the technical process of encrypting and storing it, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, so, uh, right, you, you want to be uh, figure out who writes uh, each policy. Again, typically it makes sense to have one person to be the lead author, so to speak, uh, but this does require coordination and it's a helpful process as such, right, because uh, you uh, it forces you to have conversations uh, with each other where you maybe haven't been entirely aware of what the other uh, person in the team or the other side of a system that you've been working on had been uh, thinking about a particular um, questions. And that was really the bulk of the time. Uh, the actual drafting of the CTS application, once we had you know, our spreadsheet in all green, uh, was uh, less than a month uh, doing a bunch of other things um, as well. Um, and then uh, the, for the process, uh, we got uh, very nice reviews. They only had small things. They asked us to clarify a couple of things. I don't think they requested any uh, major changes. They said nice things about QDR and then we resubmitted and it got accepted in the second uh, round that is uh, that I misspelled. Um, uh, as I said, it uh, took a long time, and um, uh, I my understanding is that it should go slightly smoother. Uh, but uh, there is still some growing pains with uh, uh, with Core Trust Seal, and sometimes uh, these do take a long time. And as someone pointed out in the chat, I forgot to mention that earlier. The, uh, after reviews, the kind of like and is in, in a journal, the editorial board makes the final uh, decision on the um, acceptance of an article. Uh, the CTS board makes the final um, decision on certific uh, certifying a journal, uh, certifying a repository as Core Trust Seal certified. And uh, it only meets so often. So if you happen to submit as an, uh, or if your reviews actually come in at an inopportune time, then you need to wait for the next board cycle and that can delay things even further. So the message here is uh, try not to be in a hurry. Um, so this is how we started out. This is from relatively early on, uh, right? And uh, based still on the original uh, DSA uh, requirements. So uh, some of the language will have changed, but you'll also see that it's quite similar, right? Uh, so we listed the requirement and then there is the specific uh, question or the specific sub requirement. And then we said, uh, do we meet this already? Are we maybe not sure and it requires more discussion or are we working on something and what are the relevant uh, policies that we have? And um, some version of this, uh, I would strongly recommend to keep track of what you're doing. Obviously it doesn't have to look exactly uh, like this, but I do love my color coded spreadsheets. Um, all right, uh, over to uh, Philip, I think, right? Yeah, Philip, would you like to dry, um, share your screen or do you want me to keep this up? I'm happy to do that. Uh, well, I think I'd like to share my screen. Okay, I will stop sharing and you can go right ahead. Yeah, can you see my screen now? Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah, so... Um, this is how we worked with the Core Trust Seal uh, at Dataverse NO. Um, for those of you, how do I change my slides? <laughs> That's strange. Now, uh, if you haven't seen our video yesterday, we are a national generic repository for open research data, mainly from researchers from Norwegian research institutions and the repository is operated at my university, at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway, and there are currently nine universities partnering with Dataverse NO, and they will have their own institutional collections. Um, and in addition, there are some special collections also. Uh, this is our application process. We started working on it um, early in 2018. We were three people from the library, university library, uh, we, and got some help from the IT department. Uh, and uh, if I remember this right, none of us had done this kind of self-assessment before. So it was a new experience for us. 
uh, we also divided the quarter C requirements between us and then followed up by common discussions. Um, and as Sebastian said, most of it should really be documented in, in a kind of policy or other do documents. So we had quite a, uh, some work to do because when we started, we didn't really have a, a fully fledged policy. Um, we then submitted, once we had this, these uh, things in place, we submitted our first version of the application at the end of June 2018. And it was, um, yeah, and after that we had to revise it. It was submitted twice more uh, based on feedback from consultants. And then finally in, in March this year, we, we, we got the certification. Um, here are some of the main challenges we, challenges we had. Uh, so we really wanted to certify the entire repository, including all um, uh, institutional collections. So this means it's quite a complex organization. Um, and the other challenge, main challenge was uh, that we had to establish a fully fledged preservation plan. So uh, first about the, the challenge uh, on um, how to ensure data and metadata quality across collections. And our approach was here that we uh, defined uh, one common set of policies and guidelines that had to be in, or that uh, are applied to all data sets in, in, in Dataverse NO. Uh, and this includes the Dataverse NO policy framework covering uh, access and use, accession, deposit, and preservation. And the policies are uh, fleshed out in, in the Dataverse NO guidelines, which are aimed at depositors curators and, and administrators or um, repository or, and collection managers. Um, and the other important thing is that we are also uh, a fully curated repository, which means that all submitted data sets are, are reviewed by support staff before publication. So to ensure that they are in compliance with our deposit guidelines and policies. Um, and in, in Dataverse NO, uh, the responsibility for collection management and data curation is distributed among the partner institutions, which means that uh, the, re the support staff at the different partner institutions are, are curating the data sets within uh, their uh, collections. Um, and the challenge here is uh, how to ensure that sufficient resources and qualified staff are allocated for maintaining each collection. Um, and our approach to this uh, was that we have a, a partner agreement, of course, with all partners, uh, which oblige, obliges the partner institutions to manage the collection in compliance with uh, the common policies and guidelines we have. But um, uh, uh, this approach is actually not sufficient uh, enough for uh, getting um, to be certified on, on this requirement on, on level four. There are different levels, four is the highest one. Um, so um, the court of civil consultants, they ask us for more uh, specific documentation of resources and qualifications. So we'll, we'll have to have another look at, uh, at this and provide some more documentation and probably also point to a, a common skill framework. And the last challenge I'll, I'll um, comment here is uh, about the preservation plan that I have mentioned. Um, so uh, the question is then, uh, the challenge is how to define a preservation plan containing specific preservation actions. Um, I mean, when we worked with the Cortrus seal uh, application, we of course had a look at other repositories who, who were certified and almost all of them have a kind of high level preservation policy, but we couldn't really find any detailed plans for for, for certified repositories. So we, we, we then finally, um, created our own plan based on, on a publication uh, by Becker and all called Systematic Planning for Digital Preservation. Uh, and it's so kind of challenging because um, uh, we didn't really find any good existing examples for research data repositories. Uh, in the question and answers uh, Google Doc we, we sent out to you, um, there was a question mentioning Dataverse NO, so uh, I have provided some answers which you can uh, read uh, on your own uh, once we share this uh, document um, online. Thank you. Sonia, you're muted. 
Thank you. Sherry had a question about the different levels in Core Trust Seal and can you get certified at other levels? Uh, I, I think also in, in each requirement, you, you, you will be, you have to define on which level you, you um, uh, fulfill the requirement. Uh, I think four is fully implemented and three is in the implementation, implementation phase and I don't remember the other ones. Uh, so, but you, you don't have to be on level four on all the requirements in, in order to get the core trust seal. Uh, I think the, the preservation uh, requirement, the long-term preservation requirement is the only requirement where you have to be on level four in the next round, you, uh, at latest uh, in the next uh, recertification round. So you have to be recertified, I think it's every th uh, third year. Yeah, so just to, to, to expand on that, every requirement states the minimum level uh, that you need to meet for CTS uh, certification. So there isn't, aren't different levels of CTS certification. CTS certification is CTS certification. Um, but you don't have to, as, as Philip said, meet every requirement to the fullest. In some cases you can say, uh, we're in the process. I think you do have to be at at least three for every requirement though. Uh, so, so two, which is, uh, we just started thinking about it. Uh, phrase more formally doesn't do it. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share our example of the process for Harvard Dataverse. Being a Dataverse that is open to the worldwide research community, um, where we have a majority of collections that are self-curated. And being that we are open to individual researchers, organizations, institutions, teaching classes. so. We've been talking for a while about how we would get certification and we decided that uh, we would base our application um, on, a, on a, a collection of self-curated and managed content. So these include mostly our large collections, uh, think IFPRI, Africa Rice, Population Services International, and they have a team behind them of data managers, stewards, and governance um, guidelines, and they have policies. This also includes journals that, are, that have policies for data sharing that are using review workflows, and that are um, at the top of the, of the journals list would be journals that are doing replication verification, or reproducibility verification for their data. So we defined what our managed collections, what we'd like our managed collections to look like based on good high standards of curation to um, those collections that are moving um, and sharing their data moving towards FAIR. And we've developed a rubric using the requirements from Core Trust Seal to make sure that our definition of a managed collection also meets the Core Trust Seal definition of good curated data. Many of the, uh, so we reached out to um, an initial group of about maybe about 100 collections, including journals, and we asked, uh, described Core Trust Seal and asked them if they would be interested in being part of the application. And for those that replied, they had to send us documentation, links to all their policies if we didn't already have them, their data management processes. Um, so that we could see that they were prepared to, um, are handling the data, curating the data with high metadata standards, using maybe multiple metadata blocks, um, that they have a goal of preserving and maintaining the data on their end before it gets to the dataverse. And once it's in the dataverse, they are committed to preserving that data going forward aside from what the software provides and what our curation team provides. So it is a community effort is what I like to call it between the managers of the collections, the Harvard Dataverse um, and the curation team um, at Harvard Dataverse. Many of the collections that we look at, so we have the rubric, we go into put the information into the rubric and then we give them a score. We can go back to many of these collections and ask if they're gonna take additional data curation and management steps to bring 
their collection to the highest standards needed to meet the core trust requirements if they're not already there because we would like to see their collections be certified. We're looking at collections that have data deposits um, at least within the last year um, that have at least maybe over 10 data sets, but we see consistency in their deposits and we see that it's a project that's going to continue. We do have a couple of historical projects in which they were just research projects that were funded and the funds are complete, the project is complete, the data are there, but there is someone who is managing um, whether it's you know giving permissions for the data or they will update the data at some point. Although it's not an active project, it's still a historical project that could be considered. So we are working with some of these collections um, to make sure that they have policies. If they don't have policies, that they have public facing policies and that they have data management guidelines in place. And these collections will also be asked to basically kind of sign an MOU that says we will continue to do this to our data for the next three years um, in order to be considered. And when the second round of applications come in three years, whenever we need to renew, those collections will already remain part of our application and then we'll start adding new collections to that, um, to that list uh, for um, to increase the number of collections that get certification. Now, because of the way our Dataverse is set up, we've um, asked some questions, and I know John had some feedback about how we would present these certified collections in any Dataverse repository. But you know, if you're a whole complete repository and your whole repository is certified, it's easier to do. For something like Harvard Dataverse, we would be looking maybe at a facet that tags data sets or collections that have been certified um, uh, for core trust. And um, Kaylin, do you have anything to add to that before I move to the next slide? No, please, please feel free. Okay. And so um, just to give you an example of what we're doing, if you see at the bottom, we have a rubric and these are just some of the requirements listed at the bottom or the questions that you get asked the different sections of the core trust. And what we do is, you know, sufficient techn technical infrastructure. What, um, sorry, I have a thing, a bar over my page here, but we tag whether it is the managed collection that's responsible for that particular variable that they're asking for, or if it's a combination of Harvard Dataverse and the managed collection. So that we can know that it's something that we have to provide or if it's something that's provided jointly, or if we have to go back to the managed collection to make sure that they are doing this at this time. If not, it's something that they would need to take on in order to be part of the managed collection definition that we have. And that's it for me, but do we have any questions on our processes that we're working on? We started our application over a year ago and the documentation that Julian and John are putting together, um, I think is something we really call for because there was just a lot of, inf especially for us trying to pull out this managed collection versus what the repository is supposed to be doing or the software is supposed to be doing. Um, so that's going to help us quite a bit in our application and filling in these these um, last uh, questions, and then we're really focused on defining um, this collection. And just so. to jump to jump in really quickly, um, Sonia, also in this, um, one of the things that we're thinking too that um, could be of benefit, you know, because you're thinking sort of downstream, what are some additional benefits of having Core Trust Seal and so forth? And that is sort of from our library side, being able to promote these managed collections kind of in a different way than we might other sort of self-deposited um, data within Harvard Dataverse. So we might uh, want to be uh, essentially promote these managed collections differently in our um, online public access catalog, um, have you know uh, various liaison librarians and so forth mention these collections uh, you know to their user communities who are looking for data, looking for data of particular categories. So that's just sort of a, an additional feature that we are looking at as well. And we do have um, at least one individual researcher who um, wanted to be um, on board. They wanted their project, their individual project to be certified. So um, 
you know, as we reach out, we'll see how many more in that collection uh, of, or in that category of individual researchers. Um, and we also are looking at licensed content. So Harvard, um, MIT, they all have a number of licensed content. So we're also investigating how we would certify licensed content uh, with all the questions that come up with the application. Um, yeah. So we had one question and Philip has answered it about, do you plan to continue to regularly renew, recertify, or is once enough if your processes and systems are not appreciably changed? And as Phil said, you do want to continue to be certified. You must be recertified every third year. And I think almost all repositories that I know of, right, like you, right. you want to claim CTS certification. So mm -hmm. I think it's very common to do this. We are certainly planning to, and I, I know most other repositories do too, uh, and uh, no, there is no, uh, and so the cost, right? We, we haven't mentioned the cost at all. Uh, I don't think this has changed since we applied. So it's $1,000 for uh, uh, CTS certification, which is valid for three years. And then it's another $1,000 uh, for the next round of certification doesn't get cheaper. Um, there is, uh, they had some sort of consortial kind of group rate, but that seemed quite difficult to, um, organized. We had talked about that in the context of the GDCC at some point. Um, I, I don't know exactly uh, how that looked. It was like it maybe it went down to 800 or so if you have at least five, something like that. And uh, given that now two years later, we're still at uh, four, I think, certified installations. It didn't make sense yet. At that point, it might make sense to revisit this in a year or two as we have a larger group of, of certified Dataverse repositories. Um, and yeah, I mean, as with all things, uh, uh, the $1,000 is an issue. The argument, that, um, the argument that CTS makes, and it's not, it's not wrong, uh, if you can't afford $1,000, um, how are you uh, able to make the types of long-term commitments um, uh, to preservation, right? That's, uh, that's kind of the argument uh, that, that the core trust seal secretariat would make about the costs, uh, right? Keeping up a repository costs a lot more. Um, but of course, you know, uh, different funding streams. So, so Brian uh, is, a, is, a, is at a library and so, the digital preservation is built into the budget. The extra $1,000 uh, isn't. So, so there certainly are challenges. I don't want to talk past them, I, but, but that's kind of the argument uh, for charging. And the fact that someone needs to uh, coordinate th the process and with as many repositories as are, run are running through the certification, this is getting real work. And it used to be that I think mainly Don's uh, kind of ran that out of their own pocket and that just wasn't sustainable. So someone needs to uh, help them be sustainable. All right, so just some um, bookkeeping here. Give me one second. Danny, um, the, our Google document is not editable. It says it can only, we can only make suggestions. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Okay, I'll open it up. Thank you, uh, because that is the Google document that we're going to go into. And the only thing, uh, other thing I don't see are the options for the breakout. I'm not sure if Murray is, uh, Murray is note taking, but I don't see the options for the breakout rooms, which is. Yeah, so, so I have those options as a host. Oh, awesome. So I'm going to just um, share my screen real quick, just to give everyone the questions and, and then um, talk about what's coming up next. And we can go from there. So um, the document has been shared and what we're gonna do is uh, go into breakout rooms and discuss the questions on the next slide. And then we're gonna summarize, summarize our responses uh, so that we can come, when you come back, you can each group can respond in about one minute to the questions that we have. And so here are the breakout room questions. And what I'll do is I'll put this into the notes document if it's not already there. I'll put this at the very bottom of the notes document, unless somebody has changed my permission. Um, 
Yeah, it looks like my permission is gone. Uh, so uh, if you could just refresh the page, that would be good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is the breakout session. You will see the questions at the bottom of the page. So please make sure that you put in your breakout room number before you start typing so that we can keep notes in there for each breakout room and then we can get back together and uh, discuss your summary. Thank you, Danny. You can assign if you're ready. Yeah, just tell me how many people you'd like in each room. Well, we only have 63 people, so let's do five rooms. Okay, that'll put 12 or 13 people in each room? Yep, sounds good. Okay, cool. I'm gonna put everybody in the breakout rooms. Thanks, Danny. Okay, uh, most people are back. So I think we can start the discussion. So it'd be nice to get a summary from each of the breakout rooms. If you have one person who's willing to speak about, you know, the, the discussion and what you came out with. So breakout room number one, I know I saw Sebastian writing. So maybe Sebastian wants to give a summary. Uh, yeah, so uh, we uh, uh, broke the rules. Uh, we only had uh, a uh, small number of people and especially small number of people who were actually at active Dataverse uh, installations. So uh, the questions uh, weren't uh, quite as uh, useful for us. And so we talked kind of more general about the certification process. And we talked a little bit about uh, kind of that big question of what is a digital <laughs> preservation strategy, which I think is really the most confusing question of, of CTS and Philip alluded to that uh, uh, too. Uh, and then uh, one thing, uh, that uh, that came out as a suggestion is uh, whether we could actually collect existing policies from GDCC members or Dataverse uh, members as they uh, fulfill uh, CTS requirements. Obviously, uh, you can access all everyone's applications once they're certified, um, but uh, might still be quicker uh, if we have a centralized clearinghouse part of uh, GDCC probably. So that's, I think, a quick summary of our discussions. Okay, so breakout room number two. I know Julian's typing. Uh, anyone for breakout room number two? I can try to summarize our discussion. So um, Thanks, no problem. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, multiple people mentioned that uh, uh, a place where uh, some place where uh, we, you know, examples could be shared um, to sort of community doc that uh, potential applicants um, uh, could review would be helpful. Um, and, and the GDCC might maintain that in some repository. Um, we we talked a little bit about uh, you know um, services and workflows and um, Sherry mentioned that it, it it seems hard to outsource that that kind of curation work um, that a collection would need. Uh, um, she also mentioned that John Crabtree had offered in, in another discussion about CTS, I think in last year's com Dataverse community meeting uh -huh. to look over drafts as a kind of pre-review yep. for the application suspension. But I think uh, everyone in the group, I, I'm not, no one had mentioned that they were certified, that they were a part of an organization that has certified their repository. Um, so, uh, and they were just looking to mostly learn about, about the process and what other Dataverse repositories have done. That sounds about right. Okay. Um, right. Sorry, Sonia, may I add a short comment? Yes, please. I mean, if, um, as I pointed out in my presentation, you, you can really uh, uh, submit several versions. Uh, so it's it's not just one version. You will get some feedback, and then you can revise your application. So we did this twice. So we really got, got some useful feedback. So it's not the case that you have to, that your application have to be, has to be perfect in, in, in the first round. I think there is up to 
four rounds or something like that is included. Right. And as Brian mentioned, data curation network for um, those looking to outsource uh, the curation support um, is something that you most of us are familiar with. But if you're not, the data curation network does do curation of data. Um, the Harvard Dataverse does curation of data, but only for the Harvard Dataverse at this point. So. Anyone from breakout room number three? Yeah, this is Brian. Um, we had a kind of an interesting group with a strong international flavor, but only one team was just getting started with Dataverse, I believe. So we didn't really get too far into the three questions. Um, I think um, one of the things that came up was, you know, are there other options for certification? I don't think there is another option. Um, I pointed out that when, so I just finished a review of a repositories and one of the ones I looked at basically pointed me to their uh, core trust certification documents, which was helpful. Um, it really focuses on the preservation aspects and you know, so there's some gaps for other kinds of things that I was looking at, but it was useful in that regard. Um, also, I. I dropped in late, but I think um, somebody was presenting on a kind of a guidance that Dataverse or they were putting together for Dataverse mm -hmm. groups. And um, I think the group agreed that that would be, that, you know, that kind of stuff would be really helpful yeah. if you're going to apply. Yeah, that's Julian and John. They're working on a document that covers what basically what Dataverse satisfies um, and how it answers the questions from the Core Trust SEAL application. So that's about as far as we got. Okay. And then um, group number four. Sorry, I, I was muted. So you can see um, we did produce a little bit of a summary there down at the bottom. Um, like other folks we talked that uh, mentioned this, um, people liked the, uh, Julian's and uh, John's document that they were working on and thought that it would also be great if, um, if that could include some type of list of upgrades, new features, other improvements and so forth that would affect um, applications moving forward. So these are sort of resources that folks ha um, had uh, thought about. Uh, the other type of resource could be a preferred file formats for long-term preservation so that everybody doesn't have to kind of come up with that on their own. Um, then there were some collaboration options that are very good. So for instance, um, uh, an idea was floated to have kind of a application affinity group where groups of users, um, who groups of uh, Dataverse uh, folks could come together who are working on applications and kind of go through that process together and learn and share in that regard. Um, the concept of a uh, repository of applications submitted prior also came up. So that's obviously something that's popular uh, across all the groups. And then also maybe a mechanism um, for indicating which Dataverse installations have received Core Trust, whether that's, you know, a badge or whatever, some type of indication. You that, are so muted, Kaylin. I'm you, muted? You muted for a second. Oh, uh, did I? Okay. Not, not anymore. Okay, no, you. great. Great, I think it's my headphones. My apologies, folks, um, bad, bad Apple headphones. Um, at any rate, the idea would be then that um, there would be some way to say, go to the Dataverse project page and find out who was uh, quickly, who had gone through the certification process as opposed to trying to go through the core trust page and locate it that way. And then finally, um, there's a the question of whether or not um, these core trust um, requirements, application requirements could help inform um, Dataverse prioritization for specific new feature requests and so forth. So those are the, those are our, that's our high level summary. Thank you. And breakout room number five. Just somebody to report back. I don't know who was in room number five. Hi, uh, it's Suni here. I can say something on behalf of breakout room five. So uh, yeah, we thought uh, it would be great if the consortium can be a clearinghouse for um, some best practices, uh, good examples, uh, especially for sensitive research data. 
Uh, so uh, how to keep a lookout for sensitive data, what to look out for, what do we do with them? And uh, for example, if we have copyright infringing data uh, or um, human identifiable data, what do we do with them when to do a session versus when to do a hard delete? So I think all these will help a lot in the governance related documentation that is needed for the core trust you application okay yeah so for infrastructure um yeah uh the data storage options uh for our um, different uh levels of sensitivity um and um uh, for we have someone from the Europe side and uh, uh, how perhaps some kind of sharing uh, from the European counterparts in regard to um, how they uh, consider the regional regulations such as GDPR uh, in their curation process. Um, and then last but not least, the preservation plans that we have heard uh, from the speakers. I think it would be great if um, the preservation plans can be uh, shared in a central place. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I just wanted, this has come up on the community mailing list recently. So Philip of the, IQSS is, uh, is put together this great map that you can see on dataverse.org of all the Dataverse installations. And that actually show, uh, has information about the, uh, which repositories are core trust seal certified. And it's based on a Google sheet that I'm putting in the group chat uh, where you can see uh, in column I uh, the, core tr the currently four core trust seal certified repositories. And that will be regularly updated. So that's. Um, and that has the direct link to the uh, to those repositories um, so you uh, applications. Right. I opened it up so people can see. That's the document, right? Yes, that's exactly what I'm referring to. Okay. We, we update this every time uh, where we, we're made aware of, of a new installation, a new Dataverse installation. Right, and Sherry is sharing the GitHub um, map. Click on it to see the details, but I don't know if I'm gonna do that right now. There we go. Okay. So I'm happy to come back to the final discussion and the wrap up. Um, I can leave this here if people would like to keep it up or we can just go back to our regular discussion, so. All right, so any final thoughts? Of course, all these documents will be taken into consideration and summarized and made available to everyone who participated, but some just some final thoughts from everyone around us. So, I mean, I think people are here at very different levels of where yeah. their repositories are. So I would, one thing that I would say is I would encourage you to think about certification. Um, it's a long-term process and that's okay. The process of getting certification and thinking about these policies is incredibly helpful for you as an institution and helps you mature in your processes and your documentation. So it's not just to get that seal, it's really to make you a better, more uh, thought out institution. And so in that sense, I would really recommend uh, starting that process, even if you don't have a ton of time and kind of, you know, maybe need months and months or every uh, two months and gradually improve. And if you get certification in three years, that, that's fine, uh, right? Most repositories, don't get it in their first two years because it takes some level of maturity. Uh, but it's great to to kind of start the process. And the criteria for the core trust seal are well thought out. They're you know integrate with other best practice models, 
uh, so that's my my one plug. Uh, go go ahead and do it. The other plug is that we ha now have increasing number of installations who are working on this. We have the fantastic data uh, community group on on Google Group, and so if you run into roadblocks, so you just you know. Uh, Feel like you get stuck just ask and there is a number of us who've uh, who've probably been there and are happy to help how many hours does the certification process take or took for people because i know for harvard dataverse obviously we, you know it's taking us a long time to put the application together mostly deciding how to present our repository but how long did it take you sebastian once you figured it out like well once the policies were written i would say uh, this was no more than uh, 20 hours to write the application, uh, perhaps. But the writing of the policies, including you know the meetings involved in that, I'd rather not count the hours. Uh, uh, yeah, I agree with Sebastian. I mean, once you already have your documentation that you can link to in place, that then you have done the work, basically. Right. Then you just have to kind of mm, write your text into the application and say, you know, uh, the, the, the preservation or preservation policy is described here and includes uh, basically these steps and so on. And the preservation plan is here and so on. So, but it took us quite a long time to establish our po policy framework. Although, I mean, we, we really, I mean, we, our uh, policy framework is based on, on the, um, uh, I think it's University of Illinois uh, when we started on working on it and then we used other examples to as an inspiration and also it's just to we adapted them so it's you, there is a lot of good um, yeah, resources out there that you can reuse. So I know that's frustratingly vague but right so if if you're thinking about writing the policies and as part of the process uh, and you start from scratch you're looking at hundreds of hours certainly um, so so if you're starting a repository from scratch you're certainly uh, like if you're if you get there in under 200 hours that would be amazing and it's probably going to be much more um, but if you already have a lot in place that number goes down Well, thank you, everyone. It's 926. So we will just end a couple minutes early. Uh, the next session on the schedule, if anybody's interested, starts at 945 for supporting sensitive data and dataverse with Mercedes, Tanya and Marion, if anyone's going to that. So, but thank you very much. We enjoyed the discussion. I think, uh, again, one of the main things for me was that we really need to work together as installations uh, to make this process smoother. Um, and talk about how we can assist each other with the curation, what the uh, what um, resources are out there for people to use. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian, Phil, Kaylin, Miguel, it was good to see you. It was good to hear from people. So take it easy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Danny.